Welcome back to Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics, CFD. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll have a very simple explanation of plot classifications which are typically used in computational fluid dynamics. You'll have seen many of these in your previous classes and work, and there'll be some unique to CFD. So sit back and relax and enjoy the ride. In our previous class, we discussed and gave an introduction overview of visualization and extraction. This is one of the major components of the post-processing phase of computational fluid dynamics. We discussed the differences and pros and cons of qualitative versus quantitative visualization strategies. We then talked a little bit about best practices, and we'll do some of that again today with these example plots. Finally, we also talked a little bit about the contemporary challenges in visualization according to the NASA 2020 CFD vision, which is what CFD should be like in the future and how we should get there based on what kind of work we need to do to obtain our dreams and goals in CFD. Today, we'll first examine plots that are most useful for computational fluid dynamics. We'll then show examples of these plots within, of course, computational fluid dynamics. We'll examine a number of excellent visualizations just for fun. Some are going to be from computational fluid dynamics and some are going to be from experiments. You can also see many of these visualizations and plots which are excellently done and put in into international competitions from CFD results in general for fluid dynamics at the link here gfm.aps.org. APS, of course, is an American Physical Society, and this is part of the Division of Fluid Dynamics, DFD. Every year, the DFD meets and has a poster competition where they try and compete for the best visualizations, and it's judged by, of course, a panel. These might seem a little bit simple to you, that is, the scatter or XY plots, but they play a critical component in CFD in that they're one of the most quantitative plots and my personal preference for showing data. These kinds of plots have been created most of your lives as students and for data analysis. So of course, these are essentially a two-dimensional graph of dependent and independent variables. They are perhaps the most precise quantitative method to present numerical data on a graph. You'll see that any reader can easily examine the quantitative data without making qualitative errors. I would argue that this is the best way to compare your predictions with measurement data in a quantitative fashion. It has to use specific and special choices of where you make XY plots, especially when you're dealing with three-dimensional time-dependent data sets. For example, you could set the x-axis to be time and the y-axis would be the variation of that time at a particular point. This is what's most often done to track time-dependent data at a particular point in space over some time in a CFD flow field. Here's one example xy plot which I created. You'll see it has an x-axis and y-axis. The x-axis is log, the y-axis is linear. You'll see that we have, of course, a number of experimental results by Tuan and colleagues and my particular model. The model here has Mach numbers from 0.3 to 11.93, and so do, the, of course, the corresponding experiments. On the y-axis, we have the root mean square of u divided by the wall shear stress. The y-axis shows the root mean square of velocity normalized by the friction velocity at the wall. So this is a boundary layer type flow comparing a model of turbulent statistics with experimental data. You'll see in this particular plot, we have shown a legend, and this legend has basically corresponding lines, say a solid line with a solid line that's red, with experiments with a symbol and predictions of no symbol. A very complicated plot like this must also be designed so that, of course, people who might be colorblind can still understand it. So each line has its own unique style, and even if this plot is shown on a grayscale or black and white printer, it'll still be useful. For example, if you publish data in a plot like this, which is very complicated, and you made all the lines maybe colored and solid, if it's printed off in grayscale, then of course readers won't be able to understand it. These are things that people think about when they're creating plots for publication. And you should get in the habit of creating these good habits too. I've also labeled an arrow on the plot with increasing Mach number sum infinity in this down left direction. This gives the idea as we go from Mach 0.3 to say 11.93, all these statistics are decreasing in amplitude um, with their normalized curve. You also see that this plot has no units. Well, why is that? Well, of course, this is because these are non-dimensional values divided by friction velocity and boundary layer thickness respectively. Let's move on to contour plots, which are much more exciting to create in CFD. 
though they're a little bit less quantitative than the excellent XY plot or scatter plot. These will provide a more global representation of the solution. You'll often see solution variables plotted through the whole domain or portion domain as a contour plot. We've showed and discussed these previously. These essentially consist and are defined by a graph of contours. You might have contours which are simply lines that are labeled, or they might be colors or some spectrum of color, which you can usually choose in your visualization system. You should try that in your visualization system when you're creating some contours. For example, make it black and white or go from red to yellow or red to green. You can choose any type of color gradients you wish. Usually the contour lines are lines along which a property is constant. That is the same for color gradients. The gradient value of the color is constant along where the properties are constant. This is just like an elevation map, which many people in the United States learn to read in elementary school or middle school perhaps. They're generally plotted such that the difference between the quantitative value of the dependent variable from one contour to the next is held constant. So for example, we would choose our contours to be say 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, etc. It's very rare to distribute them logarithmically, but this has happened and you'll see that of course in the color legend. It is very important with contour plots to always include the contour legend, unless you just want to hide the data or show the reader only what's physically happened. So in this class at least, and I think it's a very good habit to develop the practice of, of course, including the color legend with clearly labeled contours. It's also true, of course, the contours are spaced closely together will signify rapidly changes of the variable in space. That is, that is a larger gradient. The gradient magnitude is larger if contour lines are close together, and it's very slowly varying if they're widely spaced apart. Some people just don't remember this simply rule of thumb, and this is why I mention it. An example of this, of course, is near a shock wave. If we plot contours in a flow with shock waves, you'll see there are many contour lines almost on top of each other at locations of shock, shock waves. They're co-located. Why? Because, of course, a shock wave is almost like a discontinuity in the flow, and we'll expect many contours at those locations. So if we plot contours of pressure, we can almost identify what might be shock waves within our flow. Though let's be careful not to confuse them with other flow phenomena like particular slip lines or shear layers, which also have many contours. The global nature of the flow field can completely be shown in one graph through a series of contour plots. Of course, the downside of this is that it's difficult to read precise quantitative data from the contour lines, and this might result in a slightly imprecise process. As I discussed previously, of course, the contours might also use interpolation or complicated graphing techniques to project the contour field from its representation of the original numerical data through its numerical algorithms and then project it on a 2D screen or a piece of paper. Finally, there's a category of flooded contour plots, and these will use constant or varying intensity of color shading to denote value corresponding to a legend. So you can have color contour plots with lines or simply just shaded with gradients of color, or you can use a combination of the two, or you might even use a mixed plot where you have contour lines overlaid, say, velocity vectors or magnitudes of U. So you can mix and match plots and make some pretty um, aesthetically pleasing things. It's fun. Let's look at one example of a line contour plot. Here we have two spatial axes, and we have an incident shot coming in. You'll see that these contours represent and are trying to show shock-shock interactions through contours of density at Mach 0, excuse me, 5.04 with Reynolds number 3.1 times 10 to the fifth. So can you see the cylinder in this plot? Well, it's plotted right here on the right of the screen. Everything on the left represents a shock, shock structure. When a shock comes in and interacts with the bow shock of the vehicle, it creates a shock cell structure behind the bow shock, which impinges on the cylinder. It's a very interesting flow field. And if you didn't know the physics beforehand, this would be very hard to interpret. Nonetheless, we can see where these contour lines are highly bunched up that there's probably shocks. For example, along this line here, there's actually many contour lines. That represents the modification of the bow shock in front of the cylinder in this supersonic flight in Mach 5.04. 
you can see, of course, the contour lines are spaced out more in this region, and this means it's slowly varying. You can see these little triangle shapes. Well, that's just because many little contours have formed around there, and these represent shock waves, which are backing, bouncing back and forth with expansion waves contained between these two different layers. You can see that this plot doesn't tell you certain things, and it might be improved simply by adding contour labels to a select number of the plots. Better yet, we could color it with gradients and show gradients of the values through the plot. Here's two more examples of contour plots behind a particular wave, and that is a detonation wave propagating into 20% hydrogen, 10% oxygen, and a mixture of other gases. There's 15 contours plotted on the left and 35 contours plotted on the right. And you can show and see the comparisons between these two types of levels of contours. So as when you're using a visualization software package and you're trying to show contour levels, you have a choice of how many contour plots to plot in a certain range. For example, there's 15 lines on the left from ranging from 3110.62 all the way up to 46659.4. They've labeled these as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then A through F. And they've labeled these values on the left in the actual contour plot. So this way we can actually find what the values of the contour lines, which of course is a big improvement over the previous plot. Now on the right, we take the same data as on the left and simply add more contour legends. In this case, we've essentially added three more is we have GHI and we label those. You can see how much more busy the plot is on the right. We've kept the same ranges almost. You can see now the range is 1382 and the original range was 3110. Personally, I think it's best to choose ranges that give relatively even values, unless there's some reason we would want to plot a value like 46659. For example, in this case, it might be beneficial to plot maybe a range from 1,000 to 50,000, or better yet, zero to 50,000, and plot perhaps 11 contours. This way we'll have integer and equal values from zero to 50,000, and we won't have all these strange decimals in between. That could easily improve this type of plot. Let's look at one particular contour plot I made with my student for a particular paper. You can see that we have x and y. The units are in meters in brackets. The variables are italic because of course they're variables. Units are not italic because of course they're units. In this case, it's a typical high-speed boundary layer flow. The flow moves from left to right. Here's a symmetric boundary condition or slip boundary condition from negative one to zero. And from zero to three, we have a no-slip wall. Here's a static pressure outlet and we have a free stream boundary condition on the top and a stagnation pressure and temperature inlet on the left. The flow moves from left to right. Now let's look at the result through contours of Mach number. Here we've plotted Mach number from 0 to 0 0.5, which didn't appear with the software package, which is frustrating. But you can see we have increments of 0 0.06, 0 0.12, etc. But these do not correspond to the exact values. What is correspondent, of course, are the color range. And you can see we have not performed a gradient. So for example, anything in the flow which has this dark blue zip color is of course going to be zero. We would have anything between the standard red and slightly orangish red as a value of 0 0.48, which you can see directly from the color scheme. We could also add other things to this plot. We could label the boundary conditions. We could try and over superimpose boundary layer thickness as a position of x. Um, really, it's creativity that could come in, and you'll have to always just focus on what you're trying to tell the reader. Those are very standard plots in, of course, CFD and other fields. In CFD, of course, we have the unique ability to create three-dimensional plots, and these can start to become much more fun and aesthetically pleasing, but of course, much less quantitative. In a three-dimensional contour plot, we might examine graphs of constant quantities on surfaces such as aircraft, as one example, of a 3D contour plot. So if we have our computational domain, which consists of some complicated surface, and we have the solution, we can place contours of any field variable or derived quantity on that surface. So we'll have graphs of constant quantities within the flow field would also represent surfaces. For example, we could extract surfaces within the three-dimensional domain 
which have constant quantities. We could extract, perhaps, say, the magnitude of velocity, or Q criterion, which we'll talk about later. Now, the contour surfaces will be close together when large gradients of quantities are present, just like in the two-dimensional version, but these will be the closeness of 3D surfaces. If 3D three-dimensional surfaces, that is a surface that is warped in three dimensions, the contour surfaces will be spread farther apart and they will signify, of course, lower gradients. Now, remember, there is no particular knowledge of how the gradient changes between the colored lines or surfaces as the changes in the quantity might have varying derivatives. So just because we have two surfaces that are close together, we are not able to see and understand how the variable of the surfaces changes between two. That is, it may not be linearly varying. It could be actually a very complicated function or behavior. It could be oscillatory, for example, between two um, contour plots of increasing value. Let's look at one example here of a 3D contour plot. In this case, we have a nominal vehicle, and it shows the pressure coefficient on the vehicle over a surface at Mach 0.5, an angle of attack 10 degrees. The yaw angle is 30 degrees. In this particular plot, there's no legend, so it's almost impossible for us to understand what the contour levels are. All we can do is look at it and understand how the pressure coefficient varies you might be able to greatly improve this plot by simply adding a legend. Also, Axie would be wonderful to have. For example, where is this particular line really located on the aircraft? I have no way of looking just from the plot. Now, since I know it's pressure coefficient, I can probably guess that there's a very high pressure coefficient at the leading edge of the aircraft, and it's decreasing as we go downstream. Down here in the aircraft, it's much more difficult to understand and maybe guess about the values of the pressure coefficient. On top of the wings, it's probably the section side of the airfoils, and I could guess that they're lower values. I could also guess that they're higher along the tail. But once again, it's impossible to know what any of the values are, because I don't even have a single number. There's lots of ways this could be improved, and a plot like this is really only for show and aesthetics. It's not a scientific plot. Let's show something more complicated and something you'll be able to try in class with some predefined data sets. Here's a 3D volumetric contour plot. The previous contour plot was of course in three dimensions because the surface of the aircraft is in three dimensions and we would plot the values of say pressure coefficients on the surface. Here we're going to look at a sphere in a cross flow and examine its particular wake. And we are going to examine values of pressure constant constant pressure behind the sphere. Now the surfaces themselves you can see from three views, the top view, the side view, and the front view. And then they have an isometric view. I think this is a wonderful strategy. It's much like a CAD drawing, and it gives you an over an idea from a static picture what's happening. You could have also make a movie with this type of plot. Now again, they've shown surfaces of constant pressure. The sphere here is one color, which is like a light gray color in all plots. Now, the surfaces of pressure are constant along these rings which appear in the wake, especially in these side directions. You can see one of the rings here. Now the rings are colored. The color on the rings, or the surfaces of constant pressure, are not pressure. They're actually another variable, but this is not stated in the plot itself. Now it could be any variable really. Um, it could be a derived quantity, and it's best not to guess. Nonetheless, you can see how you can take the three-dimensional flow field and find basically values of constant pressure which are specified by the user. So the user who made this visualization chose values of pressure to plot. The visualization software went in and found all those values through interpolation between grid points and then connected them and created a new computational mesh within the actual three-dimensional grid that was used to find the CFT solution and created connectivity and plotted on that mesh values of another contour corresponding to that particular constant pressure. This is, can all be done now today with a few keystrokes, but imagine trying to do this 20 or 30 years ago. There wasn't really good software to do these types of things. It's amazing how fast we've progressed. One very important plot which most students learned about, perhaps in Calculus 3, or more so likely in their first fluids or aerodynamics class, is the vector plot. 
And this is a very, very popular plot, of course, because it shows velocity vectors. And it could be in three dimensions, or two dimensions, or even one dimension. Now, it will consist of a graph of vectors, which are quantities, of course, within space in a plane or in three dimensions. And it's usually shown for the velocity vectors, but recall there's other types of vectors in a safety flow field. For example, vorticity is also a vector, and you might create a vector plot of vorticity versus velocity. There's other examples. And each vector will usually have its base or location in the value at a particular cell center or grid point. This will depend on what type of solver you have. Remember, finite volume centers might store data at node centers or volume centers, so you'll have to be aware of this. In any case, your velocity vectors will likely be located at those points, and their magnitude might, if you so choose, correspond to the magnitude of the velocity. You can also create a velocity vector plot where its magnitude is something else, just to illustrate perhaps magnitudes of other quantities. For example, the direction of the vector could correspond to velocity and its magnitude might correspond to vorticity. There's no rule about how you create them as long as you are very clear to the reader on, on what you're showing. The magnitude of the vector could also be shown as the length of the arrow within the plot. This is typically what's done, but you might also have a unit length. If you have widely varying velocity magnitudes, some vectors might actually encompass the whole computational domain and look a little bit silly. And so you might have to scale the magnitudes of the velocity vectors. In practice, in most conferences, velocity vector plots have really fallen out of favor, in favor of contour plots showing perhaps the magnitude or components of velocity, because they're much clearer and less cluttered. They are really used in practice to show quantit qualitatively the magnitude and direction of the flow. We can never really back out the true values from these plots. Let's show two examples of the vector plots. On the left, we have a two-dimensional plot. Of course, this one has degrees, so the coordinate system is not necessarily, necessarily Cartesian. Here, all the magnitudes of the vectors are vary. And this does give us an idea of generally the velocity vector and direction in this, in this 2D plane at least of where the flow is going. This is much more difficult to do in three dimensions, which is shown on the right. Here we have x, y, and z in three dimensions, and we have a little box. And it's a very small grid, but at every grid point we have tried to show the base of the vector, which is the tip of the cone, and its direction, which goes out as a particular um, um, distance. So you can see a very, very small velocity vector is located here in green, and a very large one is here in red. Now the color is a little bit confusing, and it's not defined, but by looking at this, it looks like they colored the velocity vectors from blue to red. That is a function of z. So if we're at z negative 1, all my vectors are blue, and if at 1, they're all red, and they all vary through the color spectrum between. So the color here wasn't used to denote anything about the fluid dynamic quantity, but only its location within three-dimensional space. This is a good choice here because, of course, it lets the reader or viewer of the image understand what height the particular velocity vectors are and where they are in space. If this wasn't done, it'd be very easy to confuse, say, the location of this light blue vector with a dark blue one, or a red one with a green one. Is there overlapping? This is not the best plot, but I feel like it's better for just showing general flow in three dimensions. You might view some disadvantage of these plots and could see how you can easily show the left one as a simple contour plot, and perhaps it would, or even a contour plot overlaid with the vectors. In your aerodynamics or fluid dynamics classes, you often learn about streamlines. Recall streamlines are tangential to the velocity vectors. They are a fundamental and historical method for examining flow. If you have velocity vectors or any other vector quantity, you can plot the streamlines through them. And you can do this both mathematically and also try to do it experimentally for certain types of flows. And they're, of course, used to study flows. We would like to produce these in CFD also. Today, they are easily constructed with computers via the vector fields, which are typically velocity. Of course, it's used to find circulation and flow dynamics and directions, and we can even color streamlines relative to other quantities. For example, we might plot a streamline and color it as a function along its path as a pressure or temperature or any other quantity we can dream up if we desire. We can do this in two dimensions or three dimensions. These plots are much more qualitative still 
rather than quantitative, because of course we're not getting exact values at some particular space and time, like we would get with the line plot or just simply just looking at the data. But they are certainly wonderful for visualizing the flow and maybe even finding where certain flow phenomena happen, like shock waves or separation. Now, we can combine color with these plots to create time-dependent streamlined plots too, and we can watch how streamlines curve around and change. Let's look at some examples. Here's particular streamlines. The flow is moving from right to left off the surface. So here we cannot really plot streamlines on the surface, of course, because the velocity is zero. But we can put their seed there. That is the base of the streamline, and it will grow away from the surface. On this plot, the lower part is looking from the side of the body from flow moves from right to left. On the top, they've plot circular cross sections of this aerodynamic body. For example, at two diameters downstream, they level two and show the cross sectional outline. You can see for this particular flow at Mach 0.28, an angle of attack 40 degrees, and around this number of 3 times 10 to the 6, that means the flow is moving from the lower part of the figure to the upper part of the figure. This one's taken from, of course, an AWA paper. The streamlines are coming off the body, and they're wrapping around. If you look at different locations, you can see that there's actually paired vortices on the top of each particular cylinder. It's very interesting to look at, and it gives you an idea of how these vortices are, are attached and coming off the, the flow. This is a great example of using streamlines to show three-dimensional data to give the viewer an idea of what's happening with the flow of physics. It's a good plot, but how might it be improved? Another plot is from TechPlot. Here we have a flow moving roughly from left to right over a rectangular geometry. Here if we've plotted streamlines as the long black lines going in the body. And we've also plotted velocity vectors where their magnitude is corresponding to the velocity vector itself. You can see the flow comes from the left, it curves up, and it separates off the lip of the box and comes around and creates a separation bubble which is standing on it. The flow reattaches downstream and moves downstream. So by using a combination of streamlines and velocity vectors, we've shown the flow phenomena. This of course can be improved with units, which would be nice, and some legend corresponding and telling us what the magnitude of the velocity vector is itself. For example, what length corresponds to what velocity. That's not given, and we're only left guessing. Another very popular plot, of course, is the scatter plot. This is known and shown through symbols, circles, etc. And these can be drawn at discrete points within the flow. You can do this in two dimensions, like you would do with an x, y, or line plot, or you can do it in three dimensions or, or two-dimensional spaces in the domain. The magnitude of the scalar quantities will be indicated by the size of the symbol, shading, color, or other combination. And these will often be used in CFD, but are becoming more and more rare. They were very popular in the past because of the type of ways we used to make plots. Now, with advanced computers and visualization systems, these aren't as popular. One good thing about them is they tell you roughly what the data is at a particular point, which is an advantage over other approaches. Here's one excellent plot from Amtech, which is now the tech plot company. On the x-axis, we have meters. and the y-axis, we have meters again. Thanks for the units. We have the same leading body, the little rectangle, with a leading edge. So it's really the same type of flow. In this case, they have labeled at discrete grid points particular magnitude of the y component of velocity. That is, the diameter of each of these little circles corresponds to the y component of velocity. What's missing here, and not shown of course, is the contour legend that shows the diameter and its corresponding y component of velocity. Mesh plots are also very important, and they're simply shown to look at the computational grid. This is often done already during the grid generation phase, but when you're visualizing results, it's often important to show to your audience or readers what your mesh looks like. This is where you can show a lot of pictures of your mesh to show its quality and convince the reader that you've done a good job creating the mesh. We've meet, already looked at many of these examples and we won't look at too many here today, but really a mesh plot is nothing more than a graph of the nodes with particular connectivity. They can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Typically a one-dimensional mesh is not shown because it's going to be structured with constant delta x. They could of course be structured or structured. The point of the mesh 
plots is to show all the surfaces, points, or slices of the domain, and to, of course, convince readers of the mesh quality beyond statistical metrics that you've already probably reported in a particular paper or report. We'll try and combine the mesh plots now with solutions, which is a major advantage. For example, if we show high gradients of density, we might also show that we have a lot of grid points near those high gradients, so that we can, of course, capture them. This shows that your mesh has been intelligently created or modified by the solver to capture these large gradients. Here's one basic mesh plot from, of course, the dinosaur program which was an experimental program performed by NASA and the DOD. This is really a three-dimensional plot on the surface of the body, so it's a surface plot. You can see the grid is also structured, and the mesh is wrapped over the body. So it's simple to create mesh plots of your surfaces so you can see how they have been discretized. You can also show mesh, plot, mesh plots in three-dimensional space. For example, here's a nominal space shuttle, which came out of a program funded by, of course, NASA. So this particular grid shows both the surface grid on the body of the shuttle, and it shows off-body grids in one, two, three, four particular planes. This way, we can see the quality of the grid and get an idea of what the computational grid is from the solution. We've done the same thing here on the right for a different geometry, which is a simple wing. They've shown the surface geometry of the wing. They showed the grid behind the wing, which is in the fluid domain, where the fluid resides, and the, the wing, of course, is on the surface, and we showed three cross-sectional planes. You can see how the grid is completely structured, and they are completely resolving the boundary layer around the wing. That's a very excellent and well-made structured computational grid. Another plot many students don't consider uh, for a while, especially when they're dealing with, say, just Cartesian coordinates, might be where it's better to show the data as a polar or cylindrical coordinates. These are the so-called polar plots. These represent graphs of data that are dependent on some particular angle, like theta. These will be excellent for showing data or function that resides on surfaces with constant radius, such as a surface sphere. For example, we could have pressure on a sphere. By making a polar plot of it, we could easily illustrate the data and give it some physical relevance to the sphere coordinates unlike perhaps plots that would be in just a rectangular domain or traditional Cartesian plots. These are also excellent for, say, radiation data in electromagnetics or aeroacoustics, and you'll still see these types of plots much more in these particular fields. Here's one particular example, and this is, of course, for sound pressure level versus angle for a particular vehicle. The vehicle resides in the middle of the plot, and it's moving from the right to the left. We are in the Eulerian framework, and we are attached our viewpoint to the middle of the vehicle, and we are looking down at the vehicle. Now, this is a really interesting plot. You can see here's the angle in degrees from the vehicle, and we're looking down. This circle actually represents the plane of the vehicle. Now, these lines are the actual data, and the distance of the line at any particular degree from the center of the vehicle represents its magnitude. So for example, for this blue line at 5.12 kilohertz, we can look over and find its magnitude, say, at zero degrees, and trace it around to the vehicle. You can see at this particular frequency, there's no value of sound pressure level, that is noise going in the forward direction. We've looked at a number of simple plots which are easy to make with contemporary visualization systems. It's also possible to combine these plots into what we call composite plots. We've already showed a few of these already, but these are simply plots which combine different elements or basic types of plots to show something more complicated which would otherwise not be possible. It's easy to get too fancy with composite plots, and it's important to explain them in the text or within your presentation, or else your viewers or readers are going to be confused. I like composite plots, especially when you have limited space in a paper. In one single plot, you can show the flow physics and multiple flow quantities seamlessly. Here's one famous plot from the dinosaur program. Here, of course, you have the flight vehicle, and we've already looked at this plot. Once again, we have um, the axis of our three-dimensional domain, and they're plotting the surface quantities. In the upper right of the vehicle, you see they've shown the computational grid. And on the other parts of the vehicle, they showed perhaps velocity vectors. And here's some contours of pressure. So 
the description of all these quantities would be, of course, in the text. But what's wonderful about this is through one plot, they're showing their capability of the type of visualizations they can make. They were a leader in this field. Now, with the software using this class, we'll be able to make these types of plots too. It's very interesting. These are the basics of the plots we'll be making in this class, and we'll be trying all these types of plots through our homework and, of course, CFD examples. Remember, visualization is an extremely important tool to understand in physics of fluid motion qualitatively and, if used carefully, quantitatively. Do not get sidetracked into making plots which are too qualitative. That is, if you are focusing too much on the aesthetics, then you're going to miss showing the scientific quality of your work. Remember, our objective is to illustrate and convey quantitative information that can be relied on to design aerospace vehicles or something else in another field that has to do with CFD. Extracting the information from a large set of CFD is very challenging and difficult. We're not going to go into the algorithms of this class because it's beyond it, unfortunately, as an introduction class, but we will be able to try and use some of them implemented in software. Remember, it's easy to miss important flow features or even misinterpret them with bad visualization techniques, and only with time and practice will you develop good habits. Next time, we'll look at particular field variables. And we will look at particular visualization techniques in the post-processing phase for examining derived quantities. Remember, the field variables only are those given to us from the solver and are typically the densities, velocities, and pressure and temperature. Using these values, we might be interested in examining things which are more relevant to engineering, especially aerospace engineering. We'll call these derived functions. The most simple ones, of course, are averages. If we have a time varying quantity, we might take its time average or another type of average such as mass weighted. These are very important for comparing with experimental data. So from our CFD solver, we would first average the data or find derived functions and then use those with our visualization software to plot them. Particular derived functions we'll look at, of course, are here on the list on the left, like vorticity, shear stress, all kinds of turbulence quantities, shock capturing schemes and sensors, how to understand periodic events, and for many students, most interesting, the so-called Kier criterion. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.